everybody. Good evening, everyone. If everyone could take their seats, we'll get started. Because we're sitting up here. So if everyone could sit down. We have a very exciting program planned uh, for for tonight. I am. Um, I just got back from uh, APAC from Washington, D.C. I arrived today at, at, at noon, and I'll, I'll say a few words about, about that in a, in a second. Um, but first, let me introduce myself. I'm Kerry Lerman, and I'm honored to be the president of Sinai Temple Men's Club. Uh, and it's wonderful to have you all here. As I look around, uh, I'd like to first ask uh, how many here um, our new members of Men's Club. I know there's got to be at least a couple. One. Yes. <laughs> and uh, your name is? Lori Levinson and, uh, and Jeff uh, Kitchhaven, but you'll hear more about them. So all of our new members. Judy Fisher. Thank you. Who else? Parana Kostanya. Thank you, Parana. <laughs> Steve Mitzberg. Thank you, Steve. Jack Rocco. Thank you, Jack. Steve. Bob Ross. Thank you, Bob. And we now we have Bob's uh, correct email address. Erwin, hi. Welcome. Lynn. Let me give out some keepas to our new members. We can give them to our, our, our female uh, members as well because uh, if the women can wear I have to take one. All right. No, you just get one. You remember, I see. 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 And when you come to Shabbat services, make sure you wear them. Yes. All right, this is the month of uh, March. So, who has a birthday in March? There's got to be someone in Great. Shimon, has, has one. Anyone else? Oh, but we over there. Over the James. Happy birthday. Well, let's sing happy birthday. Yom Gledet Sameach. Yom Gledet Sameach. Yom Gledet Sameach. Yom Gledet Sameach. Um, before I forget, I, I have to thank a few people who were instrumental in setting up tonight's meeting. Uh, Eli Elish Merity, my... Uh, my dear friend, colleague, partner for a lot of the logistics, Daniel uh, Simenthal back there for our food. Jorge Garcia is over to the right. He's our audiovisual expert. Uh, James Atami has been very instrumental as well. And uh, Leslie and uh, Esther over there are, are, are two um, very, very hardworking, loyal members for us. Um, as I said, I just got back from APAC. It was a, a remarkable uh, several days. Uh, we had over 16,000 people there. Enormous crowd, it was the largest ever. Uh, of that, 3,000 were college students. 6,000 people were there for the first time. Um, you may remember a couple years ago at the Bernie Bush dinner, uh, our honoree, uh, our beneficiary, uh, was United Hatzalal of Israel, which was founded by um, Ellie Bear, and Ellie was there. Uh, he had Shabbat dinner with him Friday, and he was one of the presenters uh, on Sunday. Um, there was a, a short program in front of uh, all 16,000 on technological innovations in Israel, and he actually showed up by coming from backstage on an ambu cycle, driving uh, it up there, and he was, uh, he was really wonderful. He was fantastic, got a standing ovation from the crowd. Um, if you haven't been to APAC, it's a remarkable experience. You have to come with a lot of energy. Uh, not only are there sessions uh, 
plenary sessions where all 16,000 people are present. You get to hear speeches and conversations with um, really some of the most important people who are making policy. But they have these breakout sessions, um, hundreds of them, literally, on any topic you're interested in, from Israel's relation with, uh, with India, with the caucus uh, regions, uh, what's going on in Syria, what about the different terrorist groups, any hope in Palestinian-Israeli uh, negotiations. You, you name it, they had a topic with the, with the greatest experts there. But the overriding issue and theme was, of course, Iran. Uh, that, was, that, was, that was an issue that uh, really predominated quite a bit. And the way in which the issues were presented on Iran were whether or not um, Iran would be prevented from getting um, a nuclear uh, weapons capability, uh, and whether all pathways to getting that uh, would be blocked by the agreement that's being negotiated right now between the P5 plus one led by the US and, and Iran. Um, the, the main points that APAC was trying to get across is that uh, any uh, deal which is considered a good deal has to have a number of basic elements to it. One was the dismantling of Iran's nuclear infrastructure. And it was pointed out a number of times that when the talks began dismantling of those facilities was really the goal. And that has somehow morphed into something less than that. So it's more degrading their ability than dismantling their infrastructure. And it was pointed out that right now they have about 20,000 centrifuges. They have 9,000 that, that were working at the time of the interim report. Um, Israel thinks they shouldn't have any at all, or no more than a, a few, maybe 10, 15, 20 for research purposes. But it looks like that the agreement that's being negotiated is contemplating um, 6,500 of them. Second point that um, APEC um, tried to get across was that uh, Iran must dispose of all of the uranium that they've already enriched, uh, get rid of it all uh, under the agreement being discussed. That is not a requirement. Um, the third was to dismantle or convert the uh, heavy water reactor in Iraq um, perhaps into a light water reactor, and it's just not clear where that issue is going. Uh, if they're able to operate a heavy water reactor, they could produce enough plutonium for uh, two bombs in a year. A uh, third was the length of time of any deal. Uh, APAC's position is it has to be decades. The one being negotiated is a 10-year deal. Uh, then there was something that APEC felt very strongly about, which is Iran has to come clean on what their weapons program has been in the past, and they have to open up for full, uh, spontaneous, unannounced inspections. Um, the, um, the administration said that there will be inspections, but there will be no disclosure of what their activities have been to date. Um, then there's the question of sanctions, um, and sanction relief. Uh, the, um, position of APAC is that any sanctions relief should follow compliance with any agreement uh, rather than come up front. And uh, the administration's position is that there be some immediate sanctions relief uh, if, if a deal is signed. The, um, we had a number of speakers who talked about the issue. One of the most interesting was by Susan Reich. Um, she's a national security advisor. Um, and uh, she was received very courteously, and one of the issues that APEC had was to make sure that all the guests were treated with courtesy, and, um, and, and she was. Um, and her position was that the agreement that is now being negotiated is the best that we could get. Uh, we may want dismantlement, dismantlement of their facilities as a goal or as an ideal, but the fact that we can't achieve that should not stand in the way of a which she said a good agreement. Um, she said that if there is no agreement, Iran would be able to build a bomb in three months. With the agreement, um, even if they cheat, uh, they would not be able to build a bomb for one year. Now that did not give a lot of um, comfort to many people. Um, and her position was, if we don't have this deal, 
there's no deal at all, and we're better off with this deal than nothing at all. There is a lot of talk about no deal is better than a bad deal. Um, but of course, like beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, whether something's a good deal or a bad deal depends upon whether or not you're advocating for it. So if, for example, you, the U.S. signs an agreement, they're not going to say, oh, we signed a bad deal. They're going to say, we signed a good deal. So um, uh, that, that is something that we'll only know about um, in really a few weeks when the deadline for the framework will come. The, the, the overriding issues, which were detailed in many, many of these breakup sessions, as well as this, the talks in the plenary session, was a point made by uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu yesterday uh, at, um, at the session, where he said that for the United States, whether Iran gets nuclear weapons or has nuclear weapons capability is a security issue, but for Israel, it's really a survival issue. It's a question of survival. Um, uh, second was, there is recognition at many of these sessions that a nuclear-capable Iran will spark off a, a nuclear arms race with Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, among others, uh, racing to get their own nuclear um, uh, uh, weapons. And if these countries believe that Iran is only a year away from getting a bomb if they were to uh, cheat on the agreement, they're not going to wait until Iran announces that they have the bomb. They're going to immediately go into a nuclear program. Um, third, there is a recognition that a deal with Iran that gives them uh, breakout capability within a year, um, if they cheat, uh, will give them tremendous power. It will give an extension of their power in the region, which already is, is growing quite a bit. It was commented on several times that right now Iran controls capitals of Yemen, Libya, Syria, and Iraq. Um, and you can just see how it's sort of circling Israel, and they have their, um, their aims on others. And then the fourth point that was made is that if Syria is able to engage in all of these um, extraterritorial terrorist uh, activities, uh, toppling uh, various governments in the area, um, paying, uh, basically financing Hezbollah, Hamas, um, and they can do it right now with the sanctions that are on. Imagine what kind of money they would have in order to engage in all kinds of uh, folly and, and terrorist activities. Um, uh, once the sanctions are removed, they would have literally tens of billions of dollars uh, in addition. Uh, there was um, obviously a lot of controversy about whether Prime Minister Netanyahu should speak. And uh, I'll make two, two quick points, that, uh, just a few points on that, which I thought were interesting. One of the rabbis made the point that we have a Purim coming up, and uh, Queen Esther went to see uh, the king, Ashinaris, to uh, make her, her plea. And she at first was um, intimidated because she wasn't invited. And if you get, don't get an invitation, you don't go talk to the king. But she decided, because of her discussion with Mordecai, that the issue was life and death for the American, for the Jewish people. So she went to the powers that be without an invitation. The, the second story that was interesting was about um, Eddie Jacobson um, and, uh, and, and Harry Truman. Harry Truman uh, recognized the state of Israel just about 11 minutes after uh, Ben-Gurion um, proclaimed an independent state of Israel. But he wasn't going to do that uh, uh, until um, he met with his um, uh, partner in the clothing haberdashery, Eddie Jacobson. Uh, in fact, Truman, um, was adamant that he was not going to recognize the Jewish state. Um, his Secretary of State said you can't do it because uh, we're, gonna, we're going to um, disaffect the, um, the Arabs, we're going to lose access to oil, you can't do it. His Secretary of Defense said you can't do it, we're gonna, Israel can't survive without 120,000 American troops on the ground, and there's no way we're going to send Americans over there, you just can't do it. And um, Truman was adamant he was not going to do it. He didn't want to talk to any more Jews, any more Zionists at all. And his good buddy, um, Eddie Jacobson, just a common man, uneducated man who was a private uh, in World War I and fought alongside of Truman, and they were partners in the haberdashery business, uh, wanted to come see Truman 
uh, about this, and Truman said, no, Eddie, you can't come. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to talk to anybody else about this. That's the end of it. Forget it. And um, Eddie came anyway, and he, and he came into the White House, and he sat there for hours until his buddy Truman <coughs> could see him. And uh, Eddie came up, and um, Truman said, I told you not to come, and he swore at him, and he said, you son of a bitch. I told you not to come. I don't want to hear anything about these Zionists. Forget it. Um, at which point, um, Eddie Jacobson said, looked and he saw on the desk of Truman that there was a, a, a statue of Andrew Jackson, and that was Truman's hero, uh, President Andrew Jackson. And Eddie said, um, Harry, you have your, your hero right there. Well, I have a hero too, and his name is Chaim Weitzman. Won't you please spend 15 minutes with Chaim Weitzman? Just listen to my hero. And um, Truman turned his chair around, looked out, into the, uh, the garden behind uh, the, the Oval Office for a couple minutes, it seemed like hours, to um, Eddie Jacobson. And then finally Truman turned around and he said, um, Eddie, you goddamn son of a bitch, you win. I'll see your Chaim Weitzman. And of course, Chaim Weitzman turned Truman around and the rest is history from there. But that was the second example uh, where um, we had an existential issue and a, um, a Jew went to to the powers that be without an invitation. And um, it was very unfortunate, obviously, that uh, Netanyahu's um, invitation as an acceptance became a personality issue, became a distracting issue, because what he really wanted to do was to make sure that the American people had before us the substance of a policy debate about what we should be doing, and not, that, not for the American people to be presented with a fait complaint and then try to have a foreign policy or a uh, public policy dispute. And he knew that he's representing the Israeli people in a manner that's existential, and he felt he had to do it, that, that no one else was getting out the, uh, the contraposition as to what was happening. So it was a, it was a fabulous um, uh, policy conference. There was a sense of, um, uh, there, there, was a, there was a sense, I don't want to say dread, but there was a, 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 a slight pallor over everything because many people felt that the, um, the deal that's been outlined is going to be what the deal is, but we still have to wait and see. On the other hand, we were, we were treated to many, many testaments of the unbelievable creativity, vibrance, technological um, innovations in Israel, and it could only make you proud when you, when you see what, especially what these young people in Israel have been doing to make uh, the world a better place for all of us. So I hope that next year, Many of you will decide to go to APAC. It's going to be a presidential year. All the presidential candidates will be there. And it really is important to show um, uh, our support uh, for the state of Israel by, by being there. Um, the, um, the politicians uh, take notice when, when people walk uh, into their offices and, um, and, and, and make the case for Israel. So anyway, that, that's just a, a little longer than I want to go on, but that's, that, 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 that was a policy conference. Um, we are really privileged to have a Dvar Torah by uh, the Honorable uh, Norman uh, Tarl, and um, we'll hear what uh, Norman has to say. is the Parsha this week. And it opens up with God um, instructing Moses on taking a census of his people. But he does this in a, very, in a very unique type of way. First, only those who are 20 years old and older may participate by everyone taking a half a, shekel, a, half a shekel, very small and giving it as a ransom for themselves, for their soul. The rich shall not pay more, and the poor shall not pay less. That's how the partial opens. The Kotzke Remy commented on this, and he said, Moses could not understand. How could a mere coin serve as a ransom for the, a soul to God? God answered him by showing him a coin of fire. 
And the Kotzka Rebbe explained this. He said, when a person performs even a modest act of charity with the fire of passion and enthusiasm, he is indeed giving a piece of his soul. Two thoughts on this. First, everyone can give something, and everyone is required to give something. But if you turn this around, it becomes an opportunity, because not very much is necessary. You don't need a fortune. You don't need uh, an education. What you need is simply take advantage of the opportunity of the small acts of kindness, the small acts of charity that are available to us moment to moment, breath to breath. Uh, it can be a handwritten note, a visit to someone who needs it, a thank you, a smile, just a small act can do the trick. The second thought is in the passion and enthusiasm that the Kotzka Rebbe talked about. In my mind, that means mindfulness, thoughtfulness, knowing who we are, that we're doing this because we are Jewish, because it is our tradition, and because the person who is receiving that small act of kindness is made in the image of God. So we have those two concepts, the abundant opportunity to do small acts of kindness the enthusiasm, the passion, the mindfulness. Indeed, all of that is giving a piece of our soul. And let me leave you then with a prayer. May each day of your life be blessed and filled with giving and receiving small acts of kindness. Thank you. I'm on the receiving end of it. Sometimes I'm, I'm so surprised that it, it has an effect on me for, for a long time. It makes me want to give forward. So thank you so much. I'm going to show two short videos, one on Israel, uh, technological innovations of Israel, and the other one to sort of set the tone for our, um, our speakers tonight. So anyway, um, we're, we're going to, uh, we have a fabulous program now, and um, Frank, uh, Frank Melton, where are you? There's Frank. Frank's going to introduce our two uh, spectacular speakers. Come on up. Yeah, thanks, Carrie. This is really a special privilege to introduce our two speakers tonight. The two brilliant lawyers I've known and held in the highest regard for a long time for being the mentions they are, and they also have great Jewish assurance. Jeff knows a lot about negotiations. Uh, he's one of the leading mavens Southern California in this field. After graduating from UC Berkeley and Harvard Law School and being a successful business litigator in a highly regarded West Side firm, he took the leap and became a mediator about 20 years ago when this was a new and uncharted field. I remember having breakfast talking about that. Uh, and it wasn't the big business that it is today in settling all kinds of lawsuits. I can personally vouch for Jeff's effectiveness. Uh, I've uh, settled about four or five cases with him as a mediator. He's done great jobs, tenacious. Um, his bio as an independent mediator is really long, but I'm just going to say the most recent accolade, I believe you were named the best mediator in LA by Best Lawyers Magazine. He's got a long list of accolades and leadership positions uh, in mediation organizations and bars around the country. Uh, he's a he has a nationwide practice. He's really well-known speaker and leader in this field. And uh, one of the more intriguing uh, seminars that you taught, I saw it in your bio, perhaps with some relevance to tonight, was on Kabbalah and mediation. Oh. So maybe you'll talk about that at Harvard Law School. Uh, Jeff's been a very active member of our Sinai community. Of course, he's been a member of the Men's Club. He's, he's on the board of uh, the temple with me uh, for a while. Uh, three children attended Sinai Kiva, is an active showgoer. And uh, my favorite, uh, Sinai connection with Jeff actually is was Daddy and me uh, 20 years ago with our 20-something daughters and they were very young children and actually Doug Morell, Gloria's husband, <laughs> was in Daddy and me also. All those monkeys jumping yeah. out. Yeah, the, 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 I haven't forgotten any of them. The rhymes, awesome. Okay, now Lori, um, Lori also knows a lot about negotiation. She knows a lot about a lot of things. Um, uh, through um, 
her legal career has been in a different area, the criminal law area. She's a professor of law and David W. Burcham, chair at Ethical Advocacy at Loyola Law School. She teaches criminal law, criminal procedure, ethics, trial advocacy, and evidence. She's a graduate of uh, Stanford and UCLA Law School. Um, she was, uh, after that, she was a federal prosecutor for many years in the U.S. Attorney's Office before becoming Associate Dean and a professor at Loyola back in the 80s. She's been a commentator on pretty much every major criminal case uh, in the last uh, 25 years, uh, from Rodney King beating trial, the Jay Simpson murder trial on. She also comments on lots of civil cases. Uh, she's a prolific author, including uh, recently books on criminal procedure, criminal law, publications also with a Jewish focus, including uh, uh, one on Judaism and criminal justice. Uh, Lori's also been a really active member of our Sinai community and the Jewish community, a devoted mom with three children who also attended Sinai Kiva. Uh, and actually, uh, three, uh, our three daughters were classmates at one time. Um, she's been an active leader and Torah reader in our family minion. We were on the Ben Senate board together. We've been on the board of LA Hill Council, and I know you've been a great supporter of uh, this late LL in particular. And she regularly lectures for the AG and AJ here. And I just want to tell one you know, personal story about Lori. I don't get the opportunity to say this publicly. <laughs> See, this is a sense of humor. Uh, not that personal. Uh, there was a, there was an audience there, but it, 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 to me, it says um, it says it all about who she is. Lori is the very definition of a quick study, a font of wisdom, uh, and a you know person with a can-do spirit. Uh, this night, um, our oldest children were in second and third grade at Akiba, and we're going on a camping trip uh, to Northern California. Quite an interesting trip. I remember hearing the stories from Lori. <laughs> But Lori knew absolutely nothing about camping. She'd never even been camping before. At least this is uh, the lore. Um, but she loves a good challenge. She loves to be kind and helpful. So next thing you know, she's going to A16, the camping store, doing her research. And there she is teaching a room full of parents, I was one of parents, about what sleeping bags and other camping gear to buy for children, <laughs> as if she'd been camping since childhood and you know, she'd been a sales executive at A16 for me. <laughs> so this is Lori Levinson. Uh, they're, they're, I know they've collaborated before. Lori has done some videos for Jeff. Um, and this is an awesome combination. It's going to be a great program. Thank you so much. Nerdy law professor, I just have to move around a little bit. And I want to thank very much, you know, my favorite guys, Carrie Lerman and Frank Milton. Such benches, I think we would all agree, right? So uh, I would do anything for them, and I would do anything with, well, almost anything, with my dear friend Jeff Kitchhaven. So I jumped at the opportunity to speak to you, people I know and love about the topic du jour, which is the idea of the laws of negotiation and the tactics of negotiation. Now, Carrie started out by asking what month it is. And someone said March, but it's really the month of Adar. And the commandment during the month of Adar is to be joyful, right? Be happy. And tomorrow night, we will have uh, the reading of Megillah. So I know that the pressing question on everybody's mind is, what will my costume be? <laughs> but you will have to come to the reading of the Megillah to find out how tasteless I will be this year. <laughs> to give you a hint, last year I came as the Malaysian Airline Pilots. What do you think? <laughs> Too tasteful? Okay. Um, and negotiations, as Carrie raised, is really going to the heart of the existence of uh, Israel right now and whether we can negotiate peace in a world that has very little. So let me start out, here's how the program is going to go. I'm going to speak a little bit about the laws of negotiation from a Jewish perspective and talk about some of the times in our Bible and in our history we are found negotiating, whether it would be God with God or other people. After that, this brilliant man here will talk about the tactics and the strategy of negotiating. 
And then the fun part begins. We will take volunteers, or if you don't volunteer, I will volunteer you to come up and do some negotiations that we have identified in the Bible. So think about how much, you know, you have inside of you to come up and do that. Let me begin with sort of the laws of negotiation. Can anybody here recite for me in one sentence, standing on one foot, <laughs> what the law of negotiation is for Jews? Anybody, you should be able to. One foot, that's the hint. Which is, yeah, it is, if I am not for myself, who will be? If I am only for myself, who am I? If not, now when? And that you can sort of see the whole laws of negotiation. If I'm not for myself, if I don't take a position in negotiation, what's the point? If Israel doesn't stand up and say, we need the security, what's the point? On the other hand, if all I talk about are my needs, why would the person or the country on the other side negotiate? And if not now, when? In other words, you have to want and trust that you can reach an agreement. Because unless you do that, it will never happen. So let me give you a few examples. The laws of ransoming under Jewish law. This came up with Gilad Shalit, but it came up a long time before that. Back in the 13th century, there was a guy named Rabbi Meir of Rothenburg. Who knows who he was? Well, he was taken captive, hostage, by King Rudolf of Germany. And the big halachic negotiation issue was, how much can we pay for ransom? Because ransoms are negotiation. And being Jews, what was the answer? There are two opinions, right? <laughs> there are one set of rabbis who say, pay anything. He's the head of the Jewish community. We really need him. And there are other rabbis who say, don't you pay that much. Because each person is only worth the same as another person. And if you pay too much, they'll just come in with more unrealistic demands. Have we seen that to be true? Well, what happened? Does anybody know? They did not ransom the rabbi. He died in captivity. And seven years later, the price went down. I'm not sure that's a good ending. But it is a demonstration that sometimes you have to hold to your principles as well. Almost everybody here has at some point in their life negotiated. What was the biggest negotiation that stands out in your mind? Any idea? Yes? The price of a house. The price of a house. Someone else said something else. What's more valuable than your house? Your life. Your marriage. But he likes his house a little better. So sorry. <laughs> every ketubah, every contract, Every ketubah is a contract that came by negotiations. And it's right there in it. I mean, how many zuzims am I worth? Or is our happiness worth? So we have negotiation throughout our tradition. Let me give you some examples, and I want to thank Kerry. He brought some of these to my attention. We negotiate with each other in the Bible. So can you mention any that you remember from reading the Torah? Negotiations. How about ones that involve brothers? Jacob and Esau, right? And how does that negotiation go? What are they negotiating over? Anyone recall? The birthright. The, the, birthright. the birthright. The birthright. The stew, right? And here's how it goes. Esau says, give me some of that red stuff to gulp down, for I am famished. What does Jacob say? First, sell me your birthright. Esau says, I'm at the point of death, so what use is my birthright to me? And Jacob says, Let's close the deal. Swear to me first. And so Asaph swore, and Jacob gave him some bread and lentil stew. It's a negotiation. It's not a particularly effective negotiation, is it? Because somebody was just seen short-sighted. And one of the lessons we have in negotiation is you have to see the short end or the immediate result and the long end as well. Any other ideas? Yes? Uh, when Abraham negotiated with God for Sodom. You've got it. Yeah. We negotiate with God. Now you can think about how chutzpahdik that might be. 
to consider that we can negotiate with God. And you pointed out Sodom and Gomorrah. And as you remember in Sodom and Gomorrah, it's sort of the ultimate plea negotiation. But God is the prosecutor, so man, it sets pretty tough terms. And Abraham comes in and says, you know, if there are just 100, 50, 20, ultimately 10 mentions, a minion, and they can't get that together. And what do we learn from that? Well, that in negotiations, that there is a bottom. But you need to, if God is willing, God who is all powerful, is willing to sort of change the deal. Maybe we should be as well. You know, other people in the Bible negotiate with God. It's not just Abraham, who's the greatest example. Women do too. Anybody think of a woman who negotiated with God? How about Hannah? What did Hannah negotiate about? She would give, if, if she could have a child, she would serve him. If she could have a child, and that child ended up being who? Samson. Then she would have her child serve. And God listened to that proposal, and God took that proposal, even though there were changes later on. Over and over again, Jews love to negotiate. We negotiate about what happened after the golden calf. Hey, don't kill us, let's negotiate about this. Sometimes there's negotiations that are not in such good faith. Think about Laban, right, and Jacob. Jacob's supposed to get the pretty daughter. He works seven years, he shows up, and he gets my name, say, Leah, right? <laughs> and he has to go back and negotiate another seven years. Do you think he was a particularly good negotiator? <laughs> Not so good. And Abraham negotiates for the cave to bury Sarah. But does he really negotiate? He wants it so much. He basically says, let me pay you more. They want to negotiate, he wants it now. And that can affect our negotiations. And we use all sorts of tools in our negotiation. Remember Joseph, right? Joseph uses disguise, and he's really good at guilting his brothers into negotiation. That's a pretty good tool. And then my favorite is Queen Esther, right? So what tools does Queen Esther use to negotiate with the king? Beauty. She stops. The traditional negotiation tool. She stops. Now I don't particularly love that, but I think this is just by way of introduction. Yes? What is stop? as the image of how women might negotiate. And in fact, there are other women in the Torah, Devorah and the others who show great might. But you can see throughout our tradition that we take negotiations seriously. And we do it all the time. We do it in our most intimate relations. We do it in our businesses. We even do it with God. The question is, do we do it particularly well? And that's why we have Jeff Kirchhaven to tell us how we should negotiate. Jeff. Thank you. Thanks, Gloria. I really am very proud to be here. Gary, thank you for the invitation. Frank, your kind words, thinking back to those wonderful days and Daddy and me when we all rolled around on the floor with our, our babies. and. Uh, Laura, it's always a pleasure to work with you, and it's great to be here with all of you. I look out, and I see some of you, many of you I've known for a long time, and some of you have been extraordinarily successful negotiators yourselves. I see people here who have tremendous professional and business careers and are highly skilled negotiators. So I hope that I'm able to add something new to your knowledge of how negotiations operate and make you a little more conscious of what you're doing in a negotiation so that in the moment of negotiations, you can do it even better. So the question that we're going to ask is, how do you decide what to do when you're 
negotiating. You're in a position where it's your turn to do something. How do you decide what to do? Let me suggest one question to ask yourself that very few people bring to the level of consciousness in negotiations. And that is, how do I think the other side is going to react to what I do? Because the reason that you do anything in a negotiation is to provoke or evoke a certain, stimulate a certain reaction from the other side. So you have to ask yourself, what I'm about to do, what I'm contemplating doing, will it help get the other side to do what I want them to do next? And will it help get the other side to do what, that, what I want them to do ultimately? Because everything you do in a negotiation will provoke some immediate reaction from the other side and will give the other side some clue, the other side will draw some inferences from whatever you do as to where you want the negotiation to end up. So by raising this to the level of consciousness, you will start to make better decisions in your negotiations. Because once you start thinking about it, how is the other side going to react to what I do? you start thinking a lot about them. And the good negotiators spend as much time thinking about the other side as they do thinking about themselves. What are their interests? What are their needs? What do they care about? What makes them tick? What will they do next? Now, the trap that many people fall into is they start thinking, well, the other side, they should do X. Let me suggest that that line of thinking is just irrelevant to the negotiation. Because if they did what you thought they should do, you probably wouldn't be in a negotiation with them in the first place. <laughs> the fact is that what they think they should do is not really what you think they should do. And so asking yourself that question, I would suggest that Getting away from that question will make you a better negotiator. Because what they should do is really what you would do. And what you would do is not particularly what they have in mind. Now, let me add an admonition to this, which is when you start thinking about the other side and what they're likely to do and how they're likely to react, you're going to get it wrong a lot. A lot. It's okay, because by going through the process and getting the kinds of reactions that you do get, you learn and you refine your thought processes so that you are in a better position to judge how they are likely to react to what you are going to do. Think of it like a coach with a game plan. Carrie, this is the men's club, right? So we can, there are a lot of women here, but we can talk about sports because this is the men's club, right? <laughs> so think about coaches going into a game. Every coach goes into, every competent coach goes into a game with a game plan, right? <laughs> if our offense does this, their defense is likely to react this way. If we play this kind of defense, defense they'll do this on offense. Now, if you've ever been a coach and you ever had a game plan, you know that the instant the game starts, you have to change the game plan. You have to adapt because the way the players actually perform is never exactly the way you anticipate they're going to perform. Just because that happens, though, doesn't mean that you don't benefit from having a game plan. You do benefit from having the game plan. So by going through this process of continually asking yourself, how are they likely to react to what I'm going to do? Will it get them to do what I want them to do immediately and ultimately? By going through that process and imposing that discipline on yourself, you will become a better negotiator. And then people ask, well, overall, what is the best approach to negotiation? What is the best strategy for negotiation? And while you have to adapt to every different circumstance, there is an extent to which this is an empirical question. And a lot of research has been done on the question of what is the best negotiation strategy. And I want to share with you my favorite piece of the research on this. And it was 
principally done by a professor at the University of Michigan named Robert Axelrod. And Axelrod decided, uh, he studied game theory, and he wanted to test different negotiation strategies against each other. So he decided to hold a computer tournament for Prisoner's Dilemma games, where people would submit programs, computer programs, on how to negotiate in a Prisoner's Dilemma game. And Axelrod would use his computer to run millions of iterations of pitting these strategies against each other, trying to determine what is the best negotiation strategy. Now in those days, in the 19, early 1980s, there was no internet, there was no email. So how did Axelrod go about soliciting competitors to enter? He published an article in Scientific American, and he got hundreds of submissions from mathematicians, computer scientists, engineers, brilliant people from around the world. And he put these programs into the computer, had them run against each other millions of times, and the winning formula, the winning code, the winning strategy was submitted by a man named Anatole Rappaport, who was a mathematician originally from Europe, lived in the United States, in the 1960s became very disenchanted with the Vietnam War, and moved to Toronto, where he lived for the rest of his life. So Rappaport submitted the winning strategy. And here's what Axelrod did next. He published, he published <coughs> Rappaport's strategy in Scientific American. And he said, this is the strategy that won, this is the, uh, the code, the formula that won, try to beat it. And he published what it was. Because interestingly, although some of these mathematicians and geniuses submitted programs and codes that were as thick as a telephone book, Rappaport submitted the simplest strategy of all. It had only four lines of code. He could print it on one page. And so, again, hundreds of mathematicians and engineers and computer scientists and geniuses submitted strategies designed to beat Rappaport. And then, what did Axelrod do? He fed it all into his computer and ran them against each other in millions of iterations. And guess who came out in first place again? Rappaport. Yeah. So, what was Rappaport's strategy with only four lines of code? He called it tit for tat. It had four lines of instructions, which are not that hard to remember. Be nice, be provocable, be forgiving, and be clear. Be nice, be provocable, be forgiving, and be clear. Let's explain how each of those steps works. And actually, a lot of political speeches also go through this kind of strategy. And even in Netanyahu's speech to Congress today, you could see the tit-for-tat strategy unfolding throughout the speech. Many political speeches do. So what is be nice? Well, you got to start off with something collaborative. It may be something having to do with the process. It may have something to do with the substance. For example, sometimes in litigation situations where we find ourselves, Carrie, I'm sure you've seen situations I have too, where a plaintiff will start out a negotiation with a demand that's far beyond anything that a court could conceivably award the plaintiff in the lawsuit. That is not a nice strategy. That is not a strategy designed to show, I'm here to collaborate, I'm here to make a deal. What did Netanyahu do today? He started off his speech the first several minutes by complimenting everybody in town, right? Harry, I'm so glad to see you back on your feet. It's hard to keep a good man down. Well, there was a compliment in there someplace, wasn't there? <laughs> right. So the beginning of the speech, be nice. Show that you're there to be collaborative and make a deal. <coughs> what about be provocative, be provocable? Being provocable, when someone does something that is not nice, when someone does something that is aggressive, unprovoked aggression, in a negotiation, like you saw George Clooney in the movie behind us, retaliate. 
Axelrod published a book called The Evolution of Cooperation. <clears throat> the Evolution of Cooperation is a fantastic book. It outlines the history and the art and science of negotiation based on these game theory experiments. And Axelrod wrote in the book that the most surprising lesson to him from the whole Prisoner's Dilemma exercise, and the one that was hardest for him to adapt in his own life, was the value of being provocable. Because he had always been trained that being slow to anger was a good thing. But no, being quick to retaliate is in fact a good thing. Now there are certain rules of retaliation. Retaliation must be immediate, it must be proportionate, and it must be clear. Immediate, proportionate, and clear. That is the strategy for retaliation to show basically if you're going to behave, if you other side are going to behave in an unprovoked, aggressive manner, manner I'm not going to put up with. Now, on the flip side of that, for, be forgiven. Because the purpose, oh, by the way, in Netanyahu's speech, I'm sure you all noticed the parts where he was provoked, right? That was, <laughs> that was hard to miss. But now let's talk about being forgiven. Because the purpose of engaging in retaliation is to show the other side that when they depart from the nice and collaborative strategy, it does not pay. The goal is to get people to return to the more collaborative, or in game theory talk, nice strategies. Now, the temptation that many of us feel much of the time is when you're retaliating, you just want to add one extra lick, right? Because you're mad that somebody tried to antagonize you, engage in aggressive behavior against you. You want to retaliate, and you want it to be a little more than proportionate, right? And Axelrod, the game theory scholars, say, control your impulse in that regard. Because when the retaliation goes beyond proportionate, then the other side views that as a new round of unprovoked aggression and they are going to retaliate against you. So be forgiving. To put it into Jewish terms, uh, <clears throat> Frank noted in the introduction that several years I did teach a seminar for Harvard Law School called Kabbalah and Mediation. And we talk about Chochma and Mina, the twin sides of the tree of life. And if you're familiar with Kabbalah, you can see that these ideas of being provocable and being forgiven, keeping them in a kind of balance, is in some ways analogous to Kabbalistic teaching. There's much in Kabbalah which is relevant to mediation, to negotiation, life in general. It goes beyond the scope of this talk. Let me just put that in as a little bit of Yiddishkeit for all of us, since, since we are discussing it here in Shul. So then, perhaps the hardest part of it really is the fourth line of the code, which is to be clear. Because when Rappaport was writing the computer code, clear is not so hard to accomplish, right? It's in computer code. But for us, in person-to-person, human-to-human communication, being clear about things is much more challenging. What can, what's the best simple advice to give? Just try. Just try to t tell the other people, talk with the other people with whom you're negotiating about why you're doing what you're doing, particularly when you're retaliating. That it's not to set off an ever-escalating ring of retaliation, because that's very destructive. That you are ready to forgive. And we even saw some of this in Netanyahu's speech today, when he talked about if I ran wants to be treated appropriately, then it must behave appropriately itself. It was not a huge olive branch in Netanyahu's speech, but there were some hints of olive branch there. A willingness to forgive, a willingness to treat Iran differently if Iran will actually engage in different sorts of behavior itself. If you listen to the speeches of politicians in general, with this in mind, nice, provocable, forgiving, you'll see that this is the structure of the speeches of many, many politicians. And it's, 
it's very consistent with what we know to be effective negotiation uh, strategy in general. Now, what does the tit-for-tat strategy not do for you? Because there's some things that it doesn't accomplish, and we have to understand that too. Tit-for-tat strategy will not give you a negotiation result that will appear to give you a big margin of victory over the other side. In a tit-for-tat collaborative negotiation, everybody does well. People come out here and here. People who engage in combative strategies may create the appearance of a margin of victory over the other side, but their results will be here and here. So you have less, you know, fewer goodies on your side of the table, you have more than the other side. In a collaborative tit-for-tat negotiation, both people will end up with more wealth at the end of the day, but there is a kind of psychological satisfaction from doing better than the other side, which tit for tat simply won't give you. Again, you just have to discipline yourself to be satisfied with that. There are a couple of circumstances where tit for tat is simply not advisable at all. And those of you who are lawyers, you've seen this sometimes too, where the folks on the other side just seem incorrigibly aggressive. It's the only way they know how to act. And these people could not be collaborative or nice if their lives depended on it. And we have seen, those of us who are lawyers, have seen some people, hopefully nobody's ever seen us as being that way, although in truth, each of us has probably taken a turn. And so there are questions in international relations when we talk about the Iranian leadership, when we talk about Vladimir Putin, when we talk about opinions of Castro, some people's opinions of Castro have changed over the years as to whether he's somebody who, with whom we can deal or not. So in the kinds of negotiations in which we deal, we too often think that the people on the other side are incorrigibly aggressive. There are some, but don't race to that conclusion because the number of people in our day-to-day -day lives who really are incorrigibly aggressive are fewer than we think they are. The other time when tit-for-tat really doesn't make sense is when the folks on the other side just seem to be kind of random and we kind of can't figure out what affects them and what doesn't. Again, it's pr in more cases than you would think, it's, it's probably just a need on our part to do more work to find out what really makes them tick and what doesn't. But there are some situations where tit-for-tat although it's generally the best strategy for negotiation, some situations where it's really not appropriate, and we have to be sensitive to that. I, I thought it was just brilliant, and I think you can see why Jeff is such an effective teacher and negotiator. But I want you to get involved too. So I need two volunteers. Just raise your hand. Okay, raise your hand if you like me. Oh, right here, come on down. Here we go, come on down. I've got one, come on up, come on up. And we are going to negotiate uh, a couple of negotiations from the Torah. And we're going to start with the negotiation that Moses has with Pharaoh. And instead of, we're going to try it first the way that you recall. We're going to do it first from the way you recall that it's actually in the Torah. And then if you were listening to Jeff, I'd like you to try it with a slightly different technique. So do we remember what the goal of this negotiation is? What is it, everybody? Because we need to know why we're there, as Jeff taught us. What are our goals? And what do we expect the other side to say? What's our goal? Let my people go. And what do we expect dear Pharaoh to say? No. All right. Would you like to be Moshe? <laughs> Take the microphone. Come, Pharaoh. You can use mine. Oh, you want to stay in there? Okay, I'll, I'll be between you. And Moses, do the negotiation as you recall from the Pesach story, the negotiation takes place. Go ahead. What does Moses say to Pharaoh? That's all you have to do. Your Highness, Your Honor, what? Let my people go. <laughs> and your response? No. Okay, how far did we get with that negotiation? Not so good.
good. So what do you say back in the traditional story? Let my people go. Oh. No. Wow. Now, are there consequences when he says no? If you don't let my people go, I will put, I will Play. send plagues your way. No, I think first there is a snake. Snakes and frogs and hails and boils and feth, right? What's your response? Fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I make my day. This is not going anywhere. So, based upon what Jeff taught us, let's think about maybe a slightly different model for negotiation. Do you want to help her? And I will help, dear Pharaoh. Let's try. <laughs> All right. Do you have another microphone? No? You'll share. Okay, go ahead. So why don't we start by asking, uh, you might just ask Pharaoh, what would it take? What would it take, Pharaoh, to, to let my people go? See what he says. Pharaoh, <laughs> we used to be brothers. <gasps> and like, what is she doing? She's starting out with the nice. Wow, eight plus students starting with the nice. <laughs> and I still like you. Oh. You are my brother. But I need you to help me and let my people go so that they can have a better life. What can I do for you so that you can let them go? I'm speechless. <laughs> by saying, you know what, I'm not sure you could do enough for me. I need to have a workforce. I need to have a way to build my pyramids. Tell her what you need. My good brother, you know all these people are helping to build our country, so I need all these people to be here. I need you to be slaves. Now, what's the next thing? That provoking, what does she need to be? A little bit of forgiving, it hasn't been so fun being slaves, and come back with another proposal. Go ahead. If you let my people go, we will help you build your nation. But we won't help you build it as a nation. We will, as a slave, we will help you build it as, as your friend. And we might even do a better job for you. Wow! Isn't she clear? Yeah. Look, it's to your benefit to have us work not as slaves, but as free people because you'll get a better product. And when you hear that, I know, Pharaoh, it's difficult, but you might say, what? God has hardened my heart. <laughs> and you might say? Well, if we cannot negotiate as friends, then we have to do things differently. And we have, I have a very strong partner <laughs> behind me. I have God. Do you have someone to protect you and to help you? Wow, how clear was that, people? Right? And by the end, if the story were to turn out differently, you might say, let's reach. Let's reach on agreement. Let's reach again. Let's give them a hand. Two volunteers, raise your hand. It's fun. Come on. Because now you get to negotiate with God. So I need a volunteer. Thank you. Come on up. And who wants, who has a God complex around here? <laughs> what? Who has a God complex? You want to be God? No, not so much. <laughs> you can be God for me. You bet. What? Well, Francis, come on up. Francis, it's time for God to be the woman we know she is. Come on. All right. So let's think about this scenario. God appears at the burning bush. That's me, right? And uh, God's at the burning bush, and Moshe, that's who you're going to be, shows up. And each, God needs something. Think about this. God initiates 
this negotiation? What does God need? What does he need? Yeah, what does she need? Thank you. She needs Moses to uh, take the assignment, right? Uh, to go back to Egypt to say to Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses, how eager are you to do this? Because after all, by now you have a nice life. You're out there in the pasture, you got a new wife, you got your sheep, your goats, and you ran away from Egypt because they were going to kill you. So how eager are you to go back? I'm not eager to go back. I, I'm, I'm very humble. I, I, I don't even speak well. I can't, I can't lead your people. Exactly. So if I want to start the scene, God, you show up and you have to convince Moses. I am in charge. I am God. And you have to do what I ask you to do. You cannot say, I won't do. Who are you talking with? You're talking with God. Wow. How effective is that strategy? And you're like, well, I would suspect most of us, uh, assuming it's not God, and somebody comes on like that, most of us are recoil. We're repulsed by that. And it's, uh, you know, get lost. Yeah. It's a common it's, reaction to that. You know, that's great, but I'm going back to my sheep, right? <laughs> so how else might God start the relationship with Moses? Well, let me tell you, Moses, I am God. And you cannot talk to me like that. Wow. I tell you what to do, and that's a must. All right. Is it's this persuading you, Moses? Nope. If, all right, well, let me help you out here, God. <laughs> let's try this a little bit. What do you want to know before you accept the assignment? Go ahead. Let's engage, because one of the things here is that we have to be nice, provocable, and, uh, and forgiving. Lori, isn't it also, uh, I'm, I'm not such a, a scholar, you know, if it was next month and it was Pesach, I would know this better. But doesn't God also give Moses uh, some explanation of, you know, a little you bet. Patronizing, and I have, patronizing, frankly. And right? here we go. I have a crib sheet. Which could be construed as nice if it's done with subtlety, but patronizing if it's not done right. God, what would it take you? What would it take, Moses, excuse me, what would it take to make you happy? This is good. To do but, that. I have to know who you are. I don't know who are you. Well, it's time you know who I am. Excellent. Oh. Hold on. No, 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 no. Remember what God actually says. You might say that if you were God, right? But that's actually not what God says. In this negotiation, God says, I am who I am. Who I am. Right? I am who I am. Right? Almost like Popeye. God's nice. You know, God could have said, what are you doing? What are you doing asking me who I am? But God engages. Well, because that makes me, I guess, better that I can talk to him better. Good. He will, he will listen to me maybe because I'm being a friend all the time. Very nice. So now what else do you need? You know, I, I'm just a humble servant. Okay, I may believe in you, but how am I going to make them believe in you? So now you have to give the people to win. Are, are you going to be there with them every step of the way? Yes, I am. Um, I think that you could do it, and I would like you to do it. I'm asking you very nicely. How about, how about I'll help you? How about I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm I will help you. you. I will help you, and you can do it. Good. The essential thing is not be able to do it. Bingo! I believe in you, and I think you can do it. Wow, we have gone from this really adversarial, you do it because I said so, which doesn't work so well with my teenagers either, right? <laughs> to, I believe in you. You can do it. But you still have some questions. I wouldn't ask, oh, you want to ask me first? Go ahead. Well, I, I'm not so sure I can do it. I, 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 I'm not, not, not a, a very good talk talker. <laughs> God tell Moses when Moses says, I don't even speak well. I'm not a great negotiator. What does God, what does he say? Uh, I'm your brother. No, Aaron. Aaron is your brother, and I can help you with them too, with him too. Aaron's going to help you out. 
God provides the help. So every time there's a breakdown, God is the greatest negotiator because he gives us every reason to say yes instead of saying no. All right, what else? Well, yeah, Aaron, Aaron is great. He, 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 he can tell. I know he can do it. But, you know, what, what the people, you know, well, Pharaoh is so strong, and he's got all these people, the Egyptians, yeah, you know. Don't talk about Pharaoh. Let's talk about you and me. Well. I think together we can work it out better rather than to talk about this one or that one. I love that, don't you? Because now they're establishing a relationship. But I'm still very fearful. You know, I, I, I'm just I'm, I'm just a shepherd. I, you know, I, I'm kind of happy where I'm where I am, and not starting this whole. That's okay. Mission. You're a shepherd, but you can go ahead. You don't know until you try. Mm -hmm. You have to try before to say yes, I can, or no, I can't. Okay. <laughs> okay, what's the bottom line? What's in it for me? The bottom line is that you have to try first. What's the bottom line? The bottom line is you have to do it. You have to do it. Right? In the no, end. Coming back. I mean, you have to do it. I'm asking you nicely. And that's what you have. <laughs> I'm asking you nicely, but let me be clear. I am. I am who I am. Right. I am God. Let's give him a hand. And where before, we might act like pharaohs. I think the lesson of our learning tonight is to try to have a little more of Hashem in our lives and our negotiations. Thanks so much for coming out. That was really fantastic. I, I, I often marvel at just the, the wonderful people and the talent we have in this synagogue. It's, it's remarkable. Uh, there must be a few questions. We have time for a couple questions. Uh, what, is your, what was your perception after Netanyahu talking and after a couple hours Obama made the rebuttal? Well, I'll tell you what, we'll, why don't we talk about it? We'll talk about that later over dinner, but now, any questions about negotiations? negotiations? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. About being provocable, can you elaborate on that? Because many times you know that if you keep your cool or you just don't respond to whoever is provoking you, you might get to a better solution. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a difference between being provocable and being belligerent. So that ranting and raving isn't necessarily part of it. A retaliation that's immediate, proportional, and clear, could you can do it in a very calm way, and yet still let the person on the other side know you're not going to take any guff from them. So what would be what would be an example? You know, in uh, in the, in the negotiation, you know, if Pharaoh says no, Moses can say, uh, you know, well, God will, God will visit plagues upon you, right? In fact, that's part of what happens. It doesn't have to be done by yelling and screaming or ranting and raving. The actions do speak louder than words. But Leslie. <clears throat> Would you consider, Gary, um, answering the question about the negotiating techniques and skills used today by Netanyahu and Obama, not the politics? Were they effective in how they presented what they wanted? Probably depends on what cable TV station you listen to. <laughs> I, think, I think in this kind of thing, honestly, people come away, they kind of finish where they start. You know, and that we tend to filter things. If you're a fan of one side or the other, you think this one gave a great speech, you find fault with the other side's speech. And one of the great challenges in this, and Roger Fisher at Harvard Law School used to say, try to put yourself in the first row of the balcony. And if you can imagine putting yourself in the first row of the balcony, not being so partisan or having a stake in it, again, it's a difficult thing to do, and yet it can be very productive to do that because 
all the players in this, Congress, the President, the Prime Minister Netanyahu, they've all done some things very well, and they've all done some things very awkwardly. So, uh, who you like the most probably depends on who you started out liking the most. Yeah. Hey, one, more question, one more question. Frank? What if you had two sides are very unequal in power? Here is a poor schnook who got bought a, a pinto uh, suing for it. You know, they, they had to get a big ally someplace. Well, the, the question of power imbalances in negotiations are kind of facts of life. You know, uh, oh, oftentimes I'm in a negotiation, one side has more money when we evaluate lawsuits. Uh, one side may have a better lawyer, may have more resources. When we probe below the positions, though, and get to the interests, you can often find uh, sources of power in a negotiation that you didn't realize you had at first. Right, and I'm just going to jump in for a second. I think that there is an evening power, and one that's really important. I was a prosecutor. If in that negotiation, ooh, I held the power. I loved holding the power. Until I realized my ethical responsibilities. And I actually then found that well, that was pretty frightening. Because I had a responsibility to do more than, quote, win. So I think the way to even out the power is actually to get the person with the power to understand their responsibilities. Um, and uh, in my experience, that, that oftentimes, even with the resources and the big names and everything else, to make them look inside themselves and say, what are the responsibilities? It cannot be just about the KESF, the money, or the amount of time in prison, or anything like that. It has to be, as you suggested, when we walk away from this, how do we both walk away feeling good about what we accomplished. Did I step on one? Before there are some negotiations, you know, I mean, again, in the game theory literature, they talk about the shadow of the future as being the key to that kind of a negotiation. That if you go too far and take advantage of somebody in a negotiation, what's going to happen next? Because oftentimes, they, the opportunities for revenge are there, right, in any kind of relationship where there's continuing interaction between the parties. And we'll, again, in, in lawsuits, we see this. For example, if one side uh, does some sort of got procedural gotcha in a lawsuit, which we see people do. No one will ever negotiate with them again? Well, no, and people, yes, people won't negotiate with them again, or uh, the person who was exploited in round one is going to work their tuchus off to try to get back in round two. The interesting question is that when you're in a one-off negotiation, with no shadow of the future, just between people in a commercial relationship, if you have the opportunity to, you know, get all the chips on your side of the table, is there some ethical obligation not to do that? Well, and that's where I'm going to answer from our tradition. My friend, what is the first question Hashem is going to ask you, God is going to ask you, when you show up? Were you honest in your business? It is not about did you light candles on time or keep cash through. So I can't speak for any other group, but looking out among all these beautiful red kippot and wonderful women who are with you, um, I think that's sort of the underlying ethical responsibility. We are different. We are different. You could, you could see why Jeff is such a phenomenal mediator and why Lori is just a spectacular teacher who has the students in her palm of the hand. Th thank you so much. I would just like to make a closing comment. This Shabbat, um, we're honoring one of our more, more esteemed, most esteemed members. 
Max Webb is going to celebrate his birthday with us and treat, treating the congregation to what would probably be a, a fantastic luncheon and we all need to be there to honor him. Thank you, Thank you Irwin. Uh, yes, Max is one of our esteemed members. He is so generous and gives so much to, uh, to all of us. We should all try to be there. Let me make a, a couple announcements before we have dinner. Um, our um, Vice President of Special Projects, uh, James Otami, who is our, one of our negotiators, he's over there. And James wants to talk to members, in particular new members, uh, about ideas. Uh, what should we be doing? What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? What else can we be doing? So he's going to be uh, over in Lower Trout, where we're going to have dinner. He's going to be at a table. So anyone who wants to come talk to him, and please do that. Uh, he'll be there and, uh, and generate some ideas and, and, and get some involvement. March 15th, March 15th, Sunday, March 15th, that is our annual Burning Bush Dinner. And we are honoring Jan and Phil Zakowski and Lena and Frank Pornazarian. I know Frank is here. There he is. Stand up. These are two couples who, for years, have given unselfishly of their time, their energy, to our community here, to Israel, um, and I can't think of two better couples uh, for us to honor. So please sign up. I have over on the table there um, some uh, sign-up sheets. You just fill out the card, send it in. Um, the um, proceeds from the dinner are going to go towards Sinai Temple and a, a wonderful, wonderful charity in Israel called Magalim. This is an organization which identifies the bottom 10, 20% of high school classes. These are the kids who are most at risk of dropping out. And it, through counseling, through group activities, it takes these kids and makes them eligible for the IDF. Yes, some students could be so at risk, have so little, that they can't even get into the IDF. And in Israel, if you're not in the IDF, you could forget about your future. You will never be really integrated into the community. So this organization takes these kids, makes them eligible for the IDF, follows them through the IDF, out of the IDF, into college, and turns them from um, uh, really a culture of I can't do it to a culture of I can. These are kids who are so deprived, they never go to Jerusalem. They never see the Western Wall. They don't, they don't know about the culture of their own country and their heritage. Yes, and, and so many of them come from broken homes, uh, in poverty, and this organization is really trying to do something, not just for the sake of the individual, but for the sake of the community, because they take these kids and they make sure that these kids can give back to the community, become integral members of the community. Anybody here have any children who are thinking about their careers and how to succeed in their careers? No one? Anyone have any grandchildren? Anyone here thinks about their careers? How could I how could I succeed in my career? How could I advance? Well, we're gonna have an absolutely spectacular program April 7th. We are co-sponsoring this with the Sisterhood. And what we have done is we're taking, we've identified about nine or ten individuals who have achieved in their career. These are success stories. And they're gonna be on a panel, and in two or three minutes, they are going to share with the audience the secrets of their success, their defining moment, how it is that they achieved what they achieved. We, were, we have a flyer over there. Um, we, we have um, a, um, a director of a, of a, of a, of a hedge fund. Uh, we have uh, Raz Rothstein, who's a, who's a co-founder of Would Stand With Us. We have um, Andrew Singer, who's the producer of 30 Rock. Uh, Rita Stroper, you might have heard her on Shabbat Mornings. She's a Broadway actress. She uh, played Cosette in uh, Les Miserables. Um, we have um, Elad Ferber, who is the founder of Echo Labs. He's uh, from the uh, IDF Talpio project. And that's just a few of them. And uh, after they give a two or three minute, no more than that, two or three minute pearls of wisdom of their defining moments, 
then they'll go to some tables where the um, attendees could go to the table and continue the conversation. Um, so please come April 7th. We're expecting a, a huge crowd for that, and we're asking people to RSVP. So there's a flyer back there for you to RSVP. Um, besides what Irwin said about the Max, Max Webb, his birthday and the luncheon that we're going to have this Shabbat, anyone have any um, old or new business? Yeah, Ellie. I just want to say that in relation to Magalim, an organization that we're hoping will support these students once they get into college in Israel, is Magbit. Magbit Foundation loans and gives scholarships to these students, and they do have a dinner April 26th, 2015. We hope that you'll be able to be there, and there are some flyers out there as well, and of course there's the Western Region Federation as well that is honoring Oh, yeah. Richard and Carol Greenberg on April 15th. Yes, Carol, Carol and Richard Greenberg uh, will be the recipients of the Red Yamaka uh, Award, and um, we should make sure that we attend that, that event uh, as well. Uh, tomorrow is Purim, and um, there, we have a flyer there. I think they're calling it Galaxy Purim. So come, come with your children, your grandchildren. Be very very festive. Um, anything else? Anyone else have um, old new business, good and welfare? Anything at all? All right. Well, listen. Thank you all for coming. Thank you once again. It's a long